we'll move on. Children are waiting over three years for NHS treatments, according to new figures, with almost 15,000 paediatric operations cancelled last year alone. A shortage of beds and staff, as well as problems with equipment, were given as reasons for the cancellations. Well, joining us now to discuss this is NHS GP Dr Anita Raja. Good morning to you, Dr Anita. Really good to have you on the programme. Um, so paint a picture for us, because it's a very distressing headline that really drives it home for lots of people. Uh, 15,000 children's operations being cancelled. It's it's dire. It's it's disappointing. Certainly not something that you'd want in a first world country like England. Unfortunately, you're absolutely right when it comes to the main issue here. We've got uh, it's multifactorial. We've got a lack of uh, theatre beds, theatre staff, recovery nurses, lack of doctors, lack of social care, lack of equipment. Now, we certainly need to address this. And if you look back, it's years of negligence on part of the ministers because they haven't taken these problems seriously. Of course, whistleblowers have been talking about this and there's, um, you know, a lot of attention has been brought towards these problems, but they've not been addressed and not been taken seriously. And this is why we're now letting the public down. It's, it's ridiculous. There are more than 7 million people who are waiting to get an operation at the moment. It's more than many countries within Europe, the whole population. So you can imagine that it's, a, I don't think we're going in the right direction here. Mm. Well, Dr. Roger, this is the freedom of information request by the Liberal Democrats. So they're trying to make a bit of political hay out of this, but I'm um, surely a big part of the backlog is, is lockdowns and the pandemic. Well, we knew that we were putting the NHS basically under cotton wool, causing a huge backlog, and all the political parties wheeled this along. Is, is the, the lockdowns surely is, is the biggest part of this? No, I don't think that the lockdown uh, was a big part of it. Uh, let's look at the figures and numbers pre-lockdown. Even pre-pandemic, we were struggling quite a lot when it came to referrals to the hospital. So you'd be waiting at least an average of six months to see a hospital specialty. Just to put things into perspective, yes, those six months are now 12 months. For instance, if you were to see ENT and a GP would do a referral to the ENT department in the hospital, you'd be waiting on an average of 12 months. If you were to see a neurologist, now you could be waiting up to 18 months. If you were to be waiting for a hip replacement, you could be waiting two years. Yes, the numbers may have doubled, but if we look at the numbers pre-pandemic, they were pretty dire at that time as well. If I were to speak to my German colleagues and to tell them that here in the UK, our patients have to wait two years to get a hip, whereas in Germany, they'd be waiting three to four weeks, then that's a huge difference. So I think pre-pandemic, we were already drowning, but now we've drowned completely. Roger, one of the, the main talking points in this story is the fact that many of the children's operations were postponed because of a lack of staff. So surely this is only going to set to get worse with the junior doctors walking out again next week for four days. Yeah, so many people are going to now say that the junior doctors have taken an oath and it's their duty to serve mankind. And of course, uh, they're trying to do that. But the reality of the fact is that the junior doctors have not taken an oath to put their patients at risk. At the moment, 500 people are dying every single week because they cannot access care on time, which essentially means that if you come to your GP, I'll just give you this example because it's very pertinent. And we suspect cancer. Sometimes this two week wait referral, which should only take two weeks, can take up to 10 weeks before secondary care makes contact with you. Bear in mind, this is someone that we're suspecting cancer in. This is the situation of the NHS at the moment. It's very easy for our ministers to not come down and address the ground realities. It's very easy for our ministers to say that they have now been able to provide 200, 2 million extra appointments uh, per month. But uh, when it comes to GP appointments, the reality really is that uh, we are struggling. Our staff is on its knees. One doctor is doing the job of 10. They're not far off from minimum wage. And they've got a 100,000 debt when they start. So really, the doctors have got a couple of options here. One is to work for the monopoly and their militant employer. The second is that they walk out and 
immigrate to countries which would give them a better working environment. Now, from clapping to sacking, this is ridiculous. How are we blaming the junior doctors for anything? Whether the Roger. junior doctors strike or don't strike, we are in a dire state at the moment. Dr. Roger, um, perhaps another way is NHS reform. I mean, you talked there about the situation in Germany, much more healthy over there because they have the opportunity to pay to go private. They have a mixture of public and private. Is that not a way out of this? Those who can afford to pay for operations where there's a big backlog can, can pay for it to, to ease the burden on the NHS. Is the actual issue that the NHS needs a root and branch reform? This is what the government wants to do. The government wants to privatize the NHS. And as no, you and I are talking mixture. about this, it's already happening. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're already doing that. The rich are already paying privately to get their hip replacements. Do you think somebody who's fortunate enough to be able to pay for it will wait two years on the NHS? I don't think so. And I think the rich of this country also understand that they don't want to take the pressure off the NHS by paying privately if they can. Yes, the NHS needs a reform because it's not fit for purpose by the sounds of it. But let's start by paying our frontline workers. These are people who put their lives at risk. The public was out clapping for them. The government ministers were clapping for them. We've lost hundreds of our colleagues who were frontline workers during the pandemic. And now you're threatening to sack them. And let me tell you one more thing. The doctors are not asking for a pay rise. It's restoration of pay. They've had the same pay for the last 10 years. And with the rising living costs, it's now becoming impossible for them to survive on this pay. Doctors are now telling their children not to get into the medical profession. What do you think we're showing the public? We're telling the public not to get into this profession. We're telling the public not to become doctors and nurses. Okay. And, and this, is, this is not a good precedent that we want to set. Okay, Dr. Anita Roger, thank you for that impassioned display this morning. Thank you very much.